Good afternoon, everyone. Great to have you all here. I can still see people making their way in, so I invite you to come on through and find a seat. We're going to make a start this afternoon on these uh, seminars that we're doing, Ancient Mysteries Reveal the Future. I remember seeing a lot of you at our first seminar that we held in Sunnybank at the Convention Centre, so it's great to see you that you've all come along and joined us here at Mount Church. My name is Jared Martin. I'm one of the pastors of this church, so it's great to have you all along here this afternoon. Hopefully, as you came in, uh, you noticed the bathrooms are down the hallway to my left here, to your right. The bathrooms are stocked with gold or toilet paper, whatever you prefer to call it. So the bathrooms are there. There'll be drinks and refreshments in the foyer in between the different programs. If you have any questions, please feel free to come and talk to myself and I will sort it out for you. Now, we'll make a start. So Gary, I welcome you to come up. And these programs have been run around the world. So they've been run in New York and in Poland, throughout Europe, all throughout Australia. So what you're experiencing here is world class. It's not a one-off little program here in Brisbane. This is a worldwide program that Gary is presenting to us this afternoon. So we're very privileged to have you here. We're looking forward to what you have to share with us. And I know it will be interesting. I know we will discover something new this afternoon. So thank you all for coming along, and we'll make a start. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Jared. Good afternoon, everybody. Wow, we have just had an amazing journey together to many places and plenty of experience together. We're going to be traveling for the time, and you're going to understand very clearly where we are. Let's get right into it this afternoon. We have two programs and a great complaint, so let's go. Um, the first program that we're going to be talking about this afternoon is ancient, uh, the terrorist, the ancient world, the non-belief. And you'll see why we call it the terrorist of the ancient world in just a moment. The Assyrians were the great masters of the Middle Eastern or the Mediterranean region from about 900 to 600 BC. That's where they were the number one superpower at this time. I want to talk about a period from 705 to around about 681 BC when a king by the name of Sennacherib was the king of the Assyrians at this time. So we're going to see something that took place during his reign. Now, the Assyrian Empire was very vast. They ruled from the Persian Gulf down here, right across Mesopotamia, on the edges of what we would call Turkey today, and even down to what we call the Levant, or Israel, or Palestine, Syria, and down into Egypt at various times in their history. So, a very vast empire, as you can see. Now, you can imagine that because they had control of all this area, that people would want their independence in those regions that were not part of the Assyrian kingdom. And so revolts broke out in many part, parts of the Assyrian Empire during this time period. Especially one revolt took place during the reign of Sennacherib, this Assyrian king. And that was when the Israelites refused to pay taxes. Hezekiah was the king of what we call Judah. This was the southern part of ancient Israel. It was, Israel had a civil war and they ended up in two kingdoms. Israel in the north, what they called Israel, and down in the south was what they called Judah and Jerusalem. Now, so this king Hezekiah says, look, I don't want to pay my taxes any more than you Assyrians. They were the masters. So the Assyrians said, well, okay, we'll come and we'll get our taxes from you when we refuse to pay tribute. So that's when Sennacherib came from Mesopotamia and he came down into Judah and he began a military campaign against the southern kingdom of Israel. And that's what we're going to be looking at. What I want to read to you, first of all, is what the biblical account tells us in the book of Isaiah. Now those of you who were with us last weekend in the prophetic hour, notice that we saw that the biblical records were incredibly accurate historically and professionally reliable. We're going to see that again, but we're going to see something more in this first program. So Isaiah wrote that book around about 700 BC. We know that when he wrote it because of what he wrote in it and the events that were occurring at the time. And uh, if you want to have a look at a uh, the Dead Sea Scroll, there's one of those little records, the Pop Plus, which we brought along with me today, but we brought some other artifacts that you can see during the break. Now, so Isaiah originally writes 700 BC, and he writes this account of this campaign of 
son of Amos, this is the prophet, by the way we have his little bulle, uh, we had that on display but some of you didn't see it, have a look at it, this is the prophet Isaiah's bulle, we also have the bulle of Hezekiah the king, they found those since 2015 in Jerusalem. Then Isaiah the son of Amos said to Hezekiah saying, thus says the Lord God of Israel, because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, because you've asked for my help, against the Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. Notice the prediction. He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor build a siege mound against it. So he's not going to take the city. He's not going to bring his equipment uh, and set it up. That's quite a prediction because, by the way, the Assyrians were masters of taking cities. 
with their siege machines and so on. We know that from all the pictures they left behind. Now, notice what the Bible says as a result of this prediction. Then the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000 of the Assyrian soldiers. When people arose early in the morning, there were all the corpses dead. So the Assyrians were dead. So what does the king of Assyria do? The Bible says, So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed, went away, returned home, goes back to Nineveh, and remained at Nineveh. Now it came to pass, as he was worshipping in the house of Nisroch, his god, that his sons, Adremelech and Shereza, struck him down with the sword. And they escaped to the land of Ararat, then Ezahaddon, his son reigned in his place. So another son took his throne called Ezahaddon. Now that's what the Bible records. Let's put these other points up now. Here we go. No arrows would come into Jerusalem, according to the prediction. 185,000 Syrians were killed, is the record of the king. And then Sennacherib would be assassinated and his son Ezahaddon would become the king. That's all in the Bible, written way back 700 BC. All of that's there. Now, let's go and have a look at what discoveries the archaeologists have made concerning this particular campaign. As they've been digging in the Middle East, what have they found? It's unbelievable. First of all, we know Sennacherib was a king of Assyria because not only does the Bible mention him, but he's mentioned in records. Here's an image of him that you can see in the British Museum today. This guy certainly existed. Not only that, we also have mention of the siege of Lachish. And we also have the mention of Isaiah and Hezekiah mentioned on the bullet down there. You have a look after. But the siege of Lachish is actually recorded by the Assyrians. In the palaces of Nineveh, they discover these huge pictures on the walls, as I mentioned, of their hunting scenes. Here's a hunting scene. Notice the king of Assyria is having a battle with a a lion here. He's hunting him. So they had these pictures and some were military battles. One of them is the Battle of Lachish. It's in the British Museum today, a whole room given to this battle. And when you go in, inside, you'll see here are the Assyrian archers shooting their arrows at the Israelites up on top of the walls of Lachish. Then we have the guys with their slingshots. You've heard of David and Goliath and all that sort of stuff. Well, these were instruments that they used for war back in those times. So you can see the stones in the slingshots of these Assyrian soldiers. Then up come the spearmen to do their thing. It's their turn in the battle, so they march up. But then we have this one. This is a battering ram. Might be a little hard for you to see. Here is the walls of the city of Lachish. You can see that here men with their shields up on top. And here is a ramp. They've made an earth ramp to bring up their battering ram. See the battering ram here? Here's the ram belting into the wall here. Got the wheels here at the, of this battering ram, the soldiers behind it, much like soldiers behind a tank as it advances today. So the battering ram's gonna belt the wall down and then the Assyrian soldiers are going to go in. Now we find the Israelis are taken prisoner. Here are some Israelites being carted off with their animals, their children. They're taken as prisoners. They're going to be deported to other places in the Assyrian Empire. They were very famous at deporting people. These poor guys, these Israelites, are being skinned alive. There's the Assyrians skinning them while they're alive. As we said, you didn't want to be in town when these people came. These poor unfortunate Israelites are being impaled on stakes, pointy sticks, they're just pulling them down. You can see how barbaric these guys were, indeed. That's why we call them the terrorists of the ancient world. Some of you may understand a little bit now why Jonah the prophet didn't want to go to Nineveh. Wouldn't be a good idea to go and tell them their city's going to be destroyed, would it? <laughs> Not sure they'd want to hear that message and probably take your head off as you did it. But the idea of the cruelty of the Assyrians is mentioned in the biblical records. And we've just seen... That's exactly what they were. But notice the prophet Nahum, he's writing about 640 BC, the burden against Nineveh, woe to the bloody city. It is full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. Who has not felt your endless cruelty? You see, the Bible got that right for sure. 
They predicted, or they wrote, about the cruelty of the Assyrians. In fact, he's making some predictions about the destruction of Nineveh here, and we'll see that in a moment. All right, these guys, here's the king Sennacherib on his throne, the Assyrian king with his men, and these Israelites are pleading, please don't skin me alive, please don't take my... That's what's going on in the picture, you see. So all of this is mentioned in the Bible, the Battle of Lachish. We've got the battle scenes from Assyria now. Now let's come to Lachish itself in Israel. Archaeologists have been excavating this city for a number of years now. In fact, my daughter was down here, I think it was last year, excavating because she's an archaeologist there. Um, in, in, she goes to these places. And, and, and you would notice they discovered the Assyrian siege ramp. They built this ramp up so they could get their machines up onto the top to, near the wall to pound it open. So this is the siege ramp. They put all this dirt in here, no doubt with some slave labour from the Israelites who they captured in other places and they built that ramp to get their machines up. Now they even discovered right here in this place in the quiche the Assyrian helmets, the arrowheads and even the stones from the slingshots, the slings that they used. All of it discovered around Lachish. Now let's come to Jerusalem. Remember, they sent an army down to, to uh, Hezekiah at Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem, you can walk through Hezekiah's tunnel because they've discovered this tunnel today. And here it begins at what we call the Gihon Spring. This was the main water spring for, the, for Jerusalem, the city. Now Hezekiah had a tunnel underground from the spring to bring water inside the city. And so as you walk along this tunnel, you notice it goes in different directions and it's about half a kilometre long. When you come toward the end, where this gentleman is here, there's an inscription that was an inscription once. It's been stolen by someone and it's in the Turkey Museum today in Istanbul Museum in Turkey. We have an exact replica of it over here. Have a look at it over. It tells how the workmen of Hezekiah started at each end and they worked their way and they met in the middle. It goes in all different directions till they finally met up. Fascinating, but you can walk through Hezekiah's tunnel today. Then it ends here at the Pool of Siloam. Maybe you've heard the story of Jesus. He put some mud on a man's eyes, said, go wash in the Pool of Siloam, and he washed and he could see again. This is where this tunnel ends, the Pool of Siloam. Now, they've been excavating many Assyrian cities for many years now, and when they excavated these cities, they discovered these huge human-headed winged bulls. We call them Lamassu. They're in the Louvre Museum today, the British Museum. What they discovered on the flank, on the side of one of these bulls between their legs, they discovered this inscription which says Hezekiah paid taxes to Sennacherib, exactly what the Bible said, remember? So long ago written down. They discovered this bull with that on the side of it. Then they have this Sennacherib prism, and we have it here this afternoon. Three of these have been discovered. Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, had at least three made because we have three copies of it. One is in the Israeli Museum. These are all originals. This one, of course, is not. This is just a copy. Uh, one is in the Chicago Oriental Museum, and one is in the British Museum. What, has a, what Sennacherib does with this prism, it's written in cuneiform, the, the script that we talked about last weekend, the Mesopotamian cuneiform script, but this time it's the Syrian language here. He tells us the cities of Judah that he attacked. That's what's mentioned in the Bible, you remember, the cities he attacked. And when it comes to Jerusalem, this is all he says. He says, I shut up Hezekiah like a bird in a cage. He, in other words, I surrounded him. He doesn't tell us he took the city. If he had it, it would have been on here for sure because they always boast of their victories. They never mention their defeats. He never mentions the 185,000 soldiers. He men doesn't mention how he had to go home with his tail between his legs either. They didn't do those sorts of things. But it does say, I surrounded him. And that's all it says. He doesn't mention that he took the city. Thank you, Jared. Okay, so have a look at that. That's a very famous cylinder that one can see today in the British Museum. By the way, we now know Sennacherib was murdered by a son, and we even know who took his place, Ezahaddon. This is a stele from the Pergamon Museum with Ezahaddon, the man who followed Sennacherib. So everything that this book mentions 
<laughs> we find evidence for. It's, un it's incredible what they have discovered in the Middle East. The Bible, you see, is historically accurate, and even we saw some prophecies were there. But let's go a little further now in our study. Nineveh was destroyed by the Babylonians in the year 612 BC. The Babylonians and the Medes combined together and they destroyed Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian people. Now, the Bible prophets made a lot of predictions about Nineveh and its future. And I'm going to read you some of them and we're going to see what they've discovered. First of all, the Bible predicted that in the overthrow of Nineveh, in its fall, flooding would be involved. Notice the prediction from Nahum, the prophet, living 640 BC. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an utter end of its place. Talking of Nineveh, because he's writing about this place. Uh, not only that, he says these words, the gates of the river, the river gates along the river of the city, are open and the palace is dissolved. So evidently flooding was going to be involved in it. That's exactly what happened. We know what happened. When the Medes and the Babylonians were besieging the city, at that same time, the Tigris River, which is one of the two great rivers, that's why we call it Mesopotamia, the land between the two rivers, Potami, the rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. That's why it's called Mesopotamia. The Tigris overflowed. It flooded its banks and it tore a section of the wall of Nineveh out and the soldiers of the Medes and the Babylonians were able to take the city. So flooding was involved. Not only that, the Bible predicted that fire would also be involved, not just flooding, but fire. Notice what the prophet Nahum says. There the fire will devour you the sword will cut you off. It will eat you up like a locust. These are predictions. That's exactly what happened. When the Babylonians and the Medes came into the city, evidently the king set fire to his own palace on top of himself and the place was burnt. Fire did uh, was part of the destruction. In fact, when you go to the British Museum, you see these reliefs and some of them from the palace of Nineveh are all blackened with you can see them here. This is black, the original colouring up here, but they've been blackened because this was part of the destruction of Nineveh back in the times of the Bible. Nineveh was to become a desolation, according to the prophets. Notice the prediction this time from Zephaniah. He's writing at the same time period as his friend Nahum. Notice what he says about Nineveh. And he will stretch out his hand against the north, destroy Assyria and make Nineveh a desolation. Dry as the wilderness. This place is going to be, in other words, a barren place. That's what he's saying. You can come to Nineveh today. Most of the times it's dry. But you'll notice these are the walls, the whole place, just gone. Just completely gone. That's just the, 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 the walls that we're seeing under the dirt there. Flocks and birds would inhabit Nineveh, according to the Bible. Zephaniah goes on and says, The herds will lie down in her midst. Every beast of the nation, both the pelican and the bittern, shall lodge on the capitals of her pillars. Their voice will sing in the windows, desolation shall be at the threshold. So when you go to Nineveh today, notice these are the walls of Nineveh. What's grazing over the top of the walls? The flocks of sheep. This book is absolutely uncanny in its predictions. You can see right before your eyes the fulfilment of these predictions that are mentioned. All right, archaeology, not only as we saw last week, shows the incredible historical accuracy of the Bible, but it's again showing the prophetic reliability of the scriptures. But we haven't finished. During this invasion by the Assyrians, um, when Sennacherib is bringing his army in, Hezekiah got sick. We read of it in the book of Isaiah. He got very sick and he was on the point of death. So what does he do when he's about to die? He prays to God and says, God, I don't want to die. Please, can you give me some more years? God gives a message to the prophet Isaiah. I'm going to give this guy 15 more years of life. So the king lives for 15 more years. But it's such a, mir a miraculous healing of his that the Babylonians heard about it and they sent some 
ambassadors, some envoys down to Jerusalem from Babylon to find out, wow, how did you get healed like this? Because you were nearly going to die. And when they come, guess what Hezekiah does? He decides to show them, not so much talk about how God has healed him, but he shows them all his stuff when they visit him. He shows them all his gold, his silvers, his treasury, in other words. Isaiah the prophet hears about this and he comes to visit the king. He says, king, who were those guys who just came and gone now? Oh, they were the Babylonians from Medo-Persia. Oh, what did you show them? I showed them everything. I showed them my palace gold. I showed them everything that we've got here. He said, you are a fool. Because now those same guys are going to come down and come and take that stuff one day because they know what's in your bank account. <laughs> They're going to come and take all your stuff away. Notice the prediction that Isaiah made. Here are the prophecies of Isaiah concerning Jerusalem. But he goes on and makes prophecies about Babylon and the Babylonians yet haven't come to power as number one just yet because the, the Assyrians are still in power at this time. But he makes these predictions. The Babylonians will come and destroy Jerusalem and take captives to Babylon. Whoops, there's a slope there. I better watch, watch where I'm going. <laughs> or, or I might dissolve. <laughs> Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord, and they shall take away some of your sons. They shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. There's the prediction. This is made 700 BC. There's another 100 years or more to come yet, but he's making the prediction. We know this is written 700 BC because of all the stuff he's written about. Now, Nineveh is destroyed, as we saw, in 612 BC. The city is completely destroyed by the Medes and the Babylonians. Now the leading superpower becomes Babylon by 605 BC. This is the number one superpower, the Babylonians, who are also from Medo-Persia, from uh, Mesopotamia, I should say. The great king of the Babylonians at this time is Nebuchadnezzar II. He rules from 605 to 562 BC as the king of Babylon. Now, we saw last week, Gary Kent was talking about this, Nebuchadnezzar made three raids against Jerusalem. In the third raid in 586 BC, he destroyed Solomon's temple. He took the city apart and he took captives to Babylon. Among them was, we saw, Daniel. Now, Isaiah is still making predictions. He predicts that Cyrus will come to Babylon. Now, this is... This is 150 years before this is even going to take place, he's making these predictions. The Babylonians haven't even come to power. The Assyrians are still number one, as we saw, and he's making these predictions. He says Babylon's river, the Euphrates, will be dried up. That's the prediction. Let's read it. Who says to the deep, be dry. The deep meaning the water that flows through Babylon, because he's talking of Babylon. And I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus... Notice he mentions Cyrus by name. He is my shepherd. He shall perform all my pleasure. Now, Jeremiah the prophet, a hundred years later, he also mentions how, the Babylon, how Babylon would be taken and about its gates. Notice what he says. About its river, I should say. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will pledge your case. Plead your case. Take vengeance for you. I will dry up her, that's Babylon's sea, which is a reference to the Euphrates because the city of Babylon sat on the river Euphrates. That was its lifeblood, if you would. That was how it continued to survive in this desert region because of this river that brought fertility to both sides of the river and Babylon sat on it. Now he's predicting Babylon's river or sea will be dried up. Babylon's gates would be left open to Cyrus was another prediction. The gates wouldn't be shut. Notice the prediction. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him, loose the armour of kings, to open, he says, before him the double doors, so the gates will not be shut. 150 years before he's making these predictions. Another prediction. 
Cyrus would set the Israelites free and he would rebuild Jerusalem or allow it to be rebuilt. Notice the prediction. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, I have raised him up in righteousness. He shall build my city, that's Jerusalem, and let my exiles, the Jews in Babylon, he'll let them go free. That's another prediction. The last one of these predictions from Isaiah is that Cyrus would help restore the temple in Jerusalem that had been destroyed by the Babylonians. Notice the prediction here. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple your foundations shall be laid. So these are very specific predictions. You can see that. Very specific indeed. Well, were these prophecies fulfilled? That's the question now. Let's notice, those are the predictions from the Bible, what have we discovered? Well, the last night of Babylon was October 13, 539 BC. We mentioned that last week, but we didn't show you how the city was taken. It fulfills these predictions. Let's notice what happened. The Medo-Persian army had had a big fight with the Babylonians outside the city. The Medo-Persians had won the battle. The Babylonians therefore withdrew or fled back inside their city, shut their gates and thought, we're safe, we're secure. Because they had massive walls and gates. Well, the Medo-Persians under Cyrus were not going to give up that easy. By the way, at this time, according to the prophet Daniel, there was a big festival of the Babylonians. In fact, we now know from the Greek historians, Herodotus and Xenophon, that's exactly what was going on. There was a big festival at this time. They record that, about 400 BC. They report on it. Now, the Bible says there was a big feast going on. While they were having wine, women and everything was going on in their party and on in the king's palace while the army's outside the walls, suddenly a hand without a body began to write on the plaster of the palace wall. The Bible says the party came to a screeching halt right there. You can imagine if right now we saw a hand write a message up there, I guarantee none of us would be sitting here smiling. <laughs> We'd be wondering what's going on here. We'd be asking, what does it mean? Well, that's what the king asked. And so Daniel came in and told him what it meant. He said, king, it means that tonight your kingdom is done and the Medo-Persians are going to take over tonight. Okay, let's continue on. So that's the party going on. So what's, what's Cyrus doing outside? We now know what he was doing. He was doing a bit of tinkering on the river or that part of the Euphrates that actually flowed through the city of Babylon. He had his workmen uh, dig channels away from the Euphrates River, that part of it that flowed through Babylon, so to lower the river level. So now the river level drops enough so it becomes almost like a muddy river bear. And now his soldiers are able to march along the riverbed and now they're inside the city, but they're not really inside the city because the city's on both sides, so they're sort of inside, but there's walls along the river gate, river, and there's gates from those walls. So really they're not inside the city. But we know what actually happened. By the way, let me just show you here. These are the Medo-Persian soldiers. Here's the river Euphrates. Now, here's, the, here's a picture of the city that Nebuchadnezzar built. Walls with river gates, the river flowing through the middle because the city's on both sides of the river. So they weren't able to get in because the river gates, you see. But that night, those gates were actually left open, we now know from the historians. And why were they left open? Probably because this was the big festival that was going on and the guards probably got drunk. Whatever is the reason, they left the river gates open and the Medes and the Persians were able to simply march their soldiers in through the river gates and take the city and kill the king. And that's how the Babylonians were defeated. Now, all of these prophecies were fulfilled regarding Babylon, but more was to follow because Cyrus the Great, or the, the Cyrus the Medo-Persian king, he actually leaves us with a record. And 
Jared, if you could pass that for me, please. This is known as the Cyrus Cylinder. I mentioned this last weekend, but I didn't show you the full story. He records how he took Babylon, and then he also records that as a result of taking Babylon, he let the people go back to their own homelands. He let them build their temples. He helped them and let them build their cities. That's exactly what the Bible predicts, and that's exactly what the Bible records in the book of Ezra, which records the Jews going back from Babylon to uh, Jerusalem. It's all recorded there in the rocks that the archaeologists have found. Why were these predictions made? The Jews did build their temple. We know that. And uh, they built their city with the help of Cyrus. The question here this afternoon as we come toward a close is why these predictions? Why did God make all these predictions from Isaiah 150 years beforehand? Just for fun? No, let's have a look what Isaiah actually says the reason was. When we go back to Isaiah, notice he says these words, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, I have even called you by your name. He didn't call him Tom, Dick or Harry. He called him Cyrus. And that's exactly who he was called when he arrived. That's phenomenal. He said, I called you by your name. What for? That they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting. In other words, God says, I want the whole world to know from where the sun rises to where it's set. That's the whole planet. I want everybody to know something. And these predictions are made for this reason. What is it? that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Now, this is not the only time this is mentioned in the same passage. This is Isaiah 45. These predictions of Cyrus and all of this go from about Isaiah chapter 40, 41, right through to about chapter 48, 49. Let's notice another one. Remember the former things of old, God says, for I am God and there is no other. I declare the end from the beginning. In other words, how do you know I'm the only God? Well, let me tell you. I tell you what's going to happen years before it takes place. It's my signature that I am God. Prophecy. That's what God is saying here. My predictions show you who I am. I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. Before they happen, in other words. Now, Jesus put it this way. He was making some predictions himself, and he said these words. Now, I have told you before it comes, before it happens, in other words, so that when it does come to pass, you may believe. This is the reason for prophecy. It's not just so that we can say, well, aren't we clever? We know the future. No, no, no. So that when the future comes to pass, we can say, whoa, that's some God. There is a God. And prophecy helps us to believe in that God. So that's the purpose of prophecy. And that's why we have this incredible story of the Assyrians and all of those predictions about the Babylonians in the book of Isaiah. Now here's the question, the last question we want to look at before we take a break. Why does God want us to believe in him? What's the purpose? So there's a God. What's the purpose? Notice Isaiah actually spells that out too in the same passage. God says through Isaiah, look to me. In other words, trust me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Do you notice God has no favourites there? Everyone on the planet, look to me, trust me. I am God, be saved. In other words, God is reminding us of that prediction of Daniel the prophet. That stone that hits the image on the feet, we saw last weekend, that's the last empire. When there's no tears, no pain, no sorrow, no death, we're just going to live on and on and on and on eternally with none of that horrible stuff that we've been experiencing on this planet. And God, in other words, wants us all to be part of that. That's a pretty good God. And that's why he's given these predictions. And that's why as we go through these predictions in this series of programs, we're going to come to predictions very clearly that take us to our own day that we're living in. And what's the purpose? So that you and I can be part of all that that's soon to take place on this planet. You see, prophecy is given to help us believe or trust in God 
and to be saved. Let me just share with you, just quickly as we close now, this first session, my own journey, just briefly. I was 19 years of age, and I'm studying medicine at the West Australian University, studying to be a doctor. And I began at that point in my life to ask the big questions in life came to my mind. Questions like this. Is anybody out there? Is anybody out there? Is there a God? That was the first question that came to my mind. Really, is there a God? Or we just, do we just hope there is one? Or are we just adrift in a sea of time and that's just it, it's just us and we fizzle out after 50, 60, 70 years and that's it? Is there anybody out there? That was the first question. The second one was, is anybody in control? Really? Third question was, when I get to the end of life, when I come to death's door, is there anything beyond? Or is it just our wishful thinking on our part that because we want to live again or something, we want to live on? Is there life after death? These are the big questions of life that we all need to face. So I was coming to those questions. and I, So I, I, I was wrestling with these as a young man. So I began to look. So I went to, the, to what archaeologists had to say. And I discovered, as I looked at the discoveries that archaeologists have made, some of which we've shared this afternoon and last week, I began to realise that this book is not a bunch of fairy tales of myths and legends. At least it's historically true. That's the first thing I noticed, and we've seen that this afternoon. But then I also studied its predictions, some of like the ones we looked at today, some we looked at last week. And I just, as I looked at those predictions concerning ancient civilizations, I began to realise this has got a proven track record of fulfilled predictions. There, as, as, as Robbie Bergen said last week, there's something supernatural about this thing, I realised. You cannot make predictions, long-range predictions, and get them right again and again and again, and specific predictions about the name of people who's going to come in 150. You cannot get all that right again and again, but somebody's giving you some outside information. The leading psychic's batting average we saw last week is what? 16%. The best was 30 to 60% for a lady called Jean Dixon. 30 to 60 sounds pretty good, but what if you're in the 40% where she got it wrong? She predicted the assassination of John F. Kennedy. She predicted the suicide of Marilyn Monroe. She got that right. But she also said the world will have World War III in 1953, and thanks to China. That's wrong. She's not a prophet. Not of God, anyway, because that's one of the things. So someone is, someone's got some inside information here. This is a supernatural book. There's someone behind it. That's what I realised. And then as I started to look at the Bible prophecies themselves and what it was saying, and I began to read, I be, it began to affect my life. And the, the Bible has brought to me, through its messages, tremendous hope for the future. I'm not afraid to die anymore. As I know, the future is bright for those who put their hand in the hand of God. I have hope for the future, meaning and purpose in life. I love to get up every day and get cracking. There's really a reason for living. There's a hope for the future. God has a plan for our life. And uh, peace came to my life. But it's really because of some of these great things that we're going to be delving into in our ancient mystery series. There's tremendous hope. And I love this tremendous promise that Jeremiah himself makes. And he made a bunch of predictions. Notice what he says. Talking for God. And I know the plans I have for you, says God, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you. Not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And if I could just say one thing in closing this verse. That's the purpose of Bible prophecy. Plans to give us a hope and a future in your life. To give us meaning and purpose and peace and direction and hope for the future. Well, let's take time to have a break. We'll just pause for a moment of prayer and thank the good Lord for those amazing prophecies. Shall we do that? Father, this book is unbelievable. Thank you so much for the certainty, the rock-solid hope that we can have in a God who cares enough about us to tell us the future so when it happens, we can believe in him and put our trust in him. Thank you for the grand hope that's coming for this world when that rock kingdom, the last empire, takes over. Bless us as we think about these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now what's the time, Jared? Uh, 10 to 3. 10 to, great, we've got 10 minutes of break. 
you can get a drink, get some fresh air, um, and then we're going to come back here right on 3 o'clock, and we'll get into the next session. The next session that we're going to have together, amazing program, Decoding the Da Vinci Code, The Curse of the Forbidden Prophecy. I'm going to take you to an amazing prophecy in the book of Daniel, better than a Seco watch. More accurate. If you want to look at some artifacts, I'll stand here if any of you want to see them. Yeah, just, a, just a drink of water. Thanks, Jared. Hey, it's amazing, isn't that what they found? Yeah. This is an interesting one here. I'll just wait for a couple more to come. Yes, she lives in Vienna because she's doing radiocarbon dating in the Bronze Age. So she, that's got the best department for that. So she lives there, but she's backwards and forwards digging. Yes, yeah, she's doing her doctorate. Okay, well, we'll, we'll talk about this one. This is, this is, in the ancient times, if you were going to purchase some property, you'd take a piece of papyrus or vellum, deahide, and you would sign, what's your name? Steve, I, Steve, purchased this from Andrew, and uh, for so much shekels of silver, whatever it is. Then you get some people to witness that. You roll it up like so, tie some string around to keep the thing together, maybe three pieces of string on this side. You get a piece of clay, you push the clay over the string, and then you get your seal ring. Hey, thank you, bro. You get your seal ring. This was the seal ring of Pilate, Pontius Pilate. This was discovered back in 1968, 69, but no one read it. It was too, evidently too dirty. Only about a year ago they read it, were able to read it, and they found out that it's Pontius Pilate seal ring. So, so he would take his seal ring and press it into the clay, like so, and leave his impression. Now, when this document either decomposed because it was, you know, or fire burned, all that you'd be left with is that clay with the seal impression on it. And that's what archeologists call a boule. And they discovered this boule just about a year and a half ago. This is a blown up one so you can see it. It's the bulla, they believe, of Isaiah the prophet. It's got Isaiah's name on it. The reason they're pretty sure it's Isaiah the prophet, because you can see it's broken, so it broke off in the wrong place before it said Isaiah the... It didn't say what. So this one, this is the real size of it. They're about as big as your fingernail, these boule. So that's the same one. But it's right next door to another boule this one they do know, this says the, 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 the seal of Hezekiah, the king of Judah. So this, and this was found near this one here, Isaiah. And they, they were contemporaries as we just saw, they were friends, and so that's why they believe that one is probably Isaiah, but that one's definitely the king. Now, so that's, um, that's why those bullae come in important. This one here, we mentioned that one, that's Sennacherib. This is that, this is an exact size replica of the, the inscription that someone cut out and it turned up in the Istanbul Museum in, uh, in Turkey. And of course the cylinder. This one's an interesting one here. Um, by the way, that's a Roman oil lamp because we're going to talk about the Roman period next. That's a Roman oil lamp from about the time of Jesus. You can see even the soot, just a little bit of black around.
Okay. Okay. We're going to make a start in two minutes time. So I invite everyone in the foyer to make your way in and find your seats. Find your kids if they're off running around somewhere and we'll make a start in two minutes time. Thank you. Okay, we're going to begin with part number two. So if you'd like, your, like to make your way in, perhaps if one of our leaders could tell everyone in the foyer, please. And we will make a start on part number two. I loved our first presentation this evening, this afternoon. Uh, it was really interesting. Often these names of people in the Bible, they make no sense. You can barely pronounce it, you can barely read it, you know, what does this mean? You look at the names of the places, you can barely pronounce it again. It's, it's so long ago, it's so ancient, how could this possibly have any relevance to us today? But then when Gary presents it and you see the photos, you see the diagrams, you see the images, it all comes to life. You can see exactly what the Bible is describing, exactly what the prophets are saying, and then when it all comes to pass, you just go, wow, there is nothing that compares to the Bible. There is no one that compares with the God of the Bible. And so thank you, Gary, for presenting that to us this afternoon. Okay, we'll make a start. If everyone would like to make their way in, we're going to begin. Big thank you as well to our team who provided all the food, set it all up so nicely. And we'll clean it up too. Thank you to all of them. Okay, let's make a start. Okay. Let's go. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Jared? All right. Truly amazing what they've discovered, isn't it? By the way, as you leave this afternoon, make sure you pick up a copy of a summary of the programs that we're presenting, all right? We have two each time. Uh, one, the Terrace of the Ancient World, so just make sure you get a copy, one per family if we could, if that's okay. And if we run out, we'll make sure we got some more so you can pick up tomorrow uh, if you didn't get these. This just helps you to be able to look up some of the things we're talking about. People find it helpful to have, have that. All right, let's go to our next uh, session for the for today, Decoding the Da Vinci Code, The Curse of the Forbidden Prophecy. I don't know about you, but a few years ago, wherever I travelled, someone was reading this book. <laughs> it almost seemed the whole world was reading it. Um, Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. And many people thought they were reading the facts of history. We want to examine that just briefly for a moment. Dan Brown claims in his book that uh, Jesus was just a man, just a human being, and he was married to Mary Magdalene. You may have read the book yourself or heard about it. He makes quite a, a few claims. What we want to have a look at just quickly is, are his claims true? Because many people, as we say, reading that book thought they were reading uh, a, an accurate historical novel. It's a nice story, but is it accurate in its history? That's what we want to look at. Well, here's a claim that Dan Brown makes among many claims. He says that Jesus' divinity, the idea that Jesus was God in human flesh, in other words, uh, this was the result of a vote that was um, 
taken by the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. So in other words, humans decided that Jesus was God by a vote. And he says that this was a relatively close vote that came to this conclusion that Jesus was God because they voted on it, and it was a very close vote. Well, relatively close. Relatively is an interesting word, isn't it? Okay, let's read, let's have a look at the facts of history. When you go to the history books, these are the facts. Only two bishops refused to sign the council's documents. They were removed and sent into exile by the emperor. So 316 bishops signed in favour and two refused to sign. Would you call that a relatively close vote? I don't think I'd call it a close vote and I don't think the politicians would either. So Dan Brown has really sort of twisted those facts a little bit there. This is not a relatively close vote at all. Here's another one. The Bible is the product of man and collated by the Roman Emperor Constantine. Is that true? that the Bible was collated by the Emperor Constantine. Well, here's the facts. There are actually 86,000 quotations from the New Testament in the early church fathers. These are Christian leaders who lived after the Bible was finished. 86,000 quotations from the New Testament alone that they're using. And these guys lived before Constantine. So it's very clear that Constantine wasn't the one who pulled this thing together. That's, not, that's for sure. We know that historically. So Dan Brown's book may be an interesting historical novel, but it's not a historical novel. It's a novel. It's got a bunch of history that's actually not quite right, and that's why many scholars were a bit upset with it, because people thought they were reading the facts of history, but they were not. So it's an unreliable source of information, really. So if you're reading that book, just keep that in mind. It's a, it's a fairy tale. I'm seriously thinking that's what it is. It's a fairy tale. It's just a nice historical, it's a nice novel, but its history is wrong in many, many places. Now, that, however, does not, that doesn't beg this question, who is Jesus of Nazareth? Who was this man that Dan Brown was writing about? Who was he really? Who was Jesus of Nazareth? This is the person we saw last weekend who sets up this last empire, remember? He made signs of his coming and the end of the world. We saw that last weekend. And of course, that last empire with no tears, pain, sorrow and death. So who is this person, Jesus of Nazareth? That's what we want to look at. Now, Time magazine, notice what they wrote about Jesus of Nazareth. They said he's the single most powerful figure not merely in these two millennia, not during the, only during the last 2,000 years, but in all human history has been Jesus of Nazareth. That's their assessment of it. Now, of course, there are many poems written about Jesus, many songs, operas, uh, musical from Hollywood, mu uh, musical films and so on have been written and produced and art has been done about this person, Jesus of Nazareth. Who was he? First of all, I want us to notice very clearly that Jesus was a real person. There was a person called Jesus of Nazareth who did live on this planet 2,000 years ago. In fact, historians will not deny that today. And here's why. You see, there are a lot of non-Christian historians who have wrote about this Jesus from way back. They are not Christians. They're not trying to prove a point here. They're not trying to defend something. They're just writing the facts. These are non-Christian historians. For example, there's a, an historian called Thallus who in 52 AD, he wrote of the death of Jesus. 73 AD, there's a Syrian called Serapion. Serapion writes about the execution of the king of the Jews. Then there is Josephus. He was a Jewish historian who was fighting the Romans at first, then he changed sides and joined the Romans in that war that we talked about in Prophetica in Jerusalem last weekend. Josephus, this historian, he writes this. Now there was about this time, you can see he lived from 37 to 97 AD, just after Jesus himself. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, for he was a doer of startling deeds. Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, condemned him to the cross. That's almost what's written in the Bible. And yet this is a Jewish historian just recording. Perhaps the greatest 
uh, of the historians who were not at Christian historians was Tacitus. Now Tacitus was a Roman living about 55 to 120 AD. He's regarded as the greatest historian of ancient Rome. Notice what he wrote. Christus, or Christ, from whom the name had its origins, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators or governors called Pontius Pilate. That's almost what the Bible says. So Jesus really lived according to the ancient historians. But not only that, the stories of Jesus have great support archaeologically. For example, here we are at Caesarea. Caesarea was the headquarters of the Romans in the time of Jesus. They ruled Palestine from this place. And they built great palaces here. We saw Herod had a palace here last week. But they also had this great amphitheatre. They even use it today for events in Israel. Magnificent amphitheatre. And just near this amphitheatre, some years ago now, they discovered this stone. It's known as the Pilate Stone because on it is written these words, Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea. They know this guy did exist. He's mentioned many times in the biblical records. Not only that, this is, was discovered a few years ago, the ossuary of Caiaphas the high priest. Now, if you've read the story of Jesus in his crucifixion, maybe you saw Mel Gibson's blockbuster movie, The Passion of the Christ. He's tried by a Jewish leader, priest, called Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, what happened in Jewish burials in Bible times is people were put in tombs, cut in the rocks, cut in the caves and so on. You can visit some of these tombs today from way back. And then they had rooms in these tombs for the different people of the family. Well, Caiaphas is put in one of these tombs, like everybody else was, and as time goes on, his body decomposes, goes back to dust, except the bones. And what they do is they gather the bones up, when all the flesh is decomposed, and they put them in a box. And the bone box is called an ossuary. And so just recently they discovered the ossuary of Caiaphas, the high priest. You can see it in the Israeli museum today. So the various people and events that are recorded by the Bible about concerning Jesus, they're finding this stuff today in, in, in Israel. So he was a real person. That's not, be, that's not a question. But who was Jesus? Who was this Jesus of Nazareth? Was he uh, a good man, say like Buddha, or maybe Confucius, or Muhammad, or Jeremiah, the Bible prophet? Was he just a good man? Well, let's see who Jesus claimed to be. What did he claim himself? Let's notice what Jesus claimed. We go to the book of Revelation now, and we're going to be going into this book more because it deals especially with our time, as we're going to see. You're going to understand the great prophecies of Revelation. When we go to the book of Revelation as it ends, Jesus says something because Jesus gives the revelation to John. That's what the claim is. It's Jesus giving this story. He's with John on Patmos. Notice what it says here in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12 and 13. This is what Jesus says. Behold, I come quickly. I am the Alpha and the Omega. That's the first letter of the Greek alphabet and Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. That means I'm the beginning and I'm the end. I'm the first and I'm the last. Notice the claim here of Jesus of Nazareth. I am the Alpha and I'm the Omega. I am the first and I am the last. That's what he calls himself. Well, so what? Well, when you go to the beginning of the book of Revelation, you read these words. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, who is to come. And then it adds this word, the Almighty. There's no one greater than the Almighty. That's Almighty. So the Alpha and the Omega is the Almighty God, according to Revelation. And Jesus is claiming to be the Alpha and the Omega. So Jesus is actually claiming to be God Almighty. In actual fact, he's getting this from the book of Isaiah, where we were in our last session, the same chapters dealing with Cyrus and so on. Notice what it said here 
God is speaking. Thus says the Lord. Now, whenever you see the Lord in capitals, capital L-O-R-D, it's the great name of God called Yahweh or Jehovah. It means the I, I am. I've always been. I, I am. So, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first. And I am the last, and beside me there is no God. In other words, Jesus is claiming to be God Almighty. That's a big claim, isn't it? Now, he is either mad for making a claim, because if I came here this afternoon and stood up after Jared introduces me, and I says, well, folks, great to see you, I'm God. You would say, that guy's got rocks in his head. Something crazy about him, right? You would. And you'd be right. Now, Jesus is either mad because if he claims to be God and he doesn't know the difference, he doesn't get it, he doesn't realise, but he's claiming to be God and he, something's wrong with, his, with his, 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 his head, right? So he'd be mad. Or he's bad. I don't know about you, when I was a kid, I was taught that if you tell lies, this is not a good thing. No telling whoppers, we tell our kids, you know. White lies, black lies, they're all lies. So if Jesus is claiming to be God, he knows he's not, but he's claiming to be God, then he's a liar. So he's either mad, crazy, or he's bad because he's lying. He's telling something that he knows he's not. Or the only other choice is he's God. That's the three choices we have for who Jesus claimed to be. Crazy, a liar, or he who is what he claimed to be. So how would we know that? Well, we're going to show you uh, that this afternoon. We're going to give the evidence for this. Because sure, certainly Muhammad never claimed to be God. Nor did Buddha, nor did Confucius, nor did Jeremiah. None of these claimed to be God. But Jesus did. He even accepted people when they worshipped him. And the Bible says only worship God, you see. So he, he, he believed he was God. So was he? That's the question. Well, let's go back to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Jared, if I can have that little, uh, little bottle there. Thank you, man. Yeah. Now, we mentioned that in the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, that were found in Israel, we mentioned last week and we showed you why these date back to 100 to 200 BC. By the way, I said the, big, the real ones are about so high, so round, much bigger than this thing. But inside were these scrolls made of deer hide, many of them. And Isaiah had almost two complete scrolls in this, or the scrolls of Isaiah, two, almost two of them, almost complete, they discovered in the collection here. And these scrolls, which date back to 100 to 200 years before Christ, these are just copies, these are not the originals. The originals go back to 700 BC for Isaiah, or 1000 BC for the Psalms. Now, these scrolls have a proven track record of fulfilled predictions we saw. Daniel the prophet, we saw some of his predictions in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and so on. Now, these predictions not only concern the times we're living in, but there's lots of predictions concerning the Christ that's coming, Jesus of Nazareth, if you would. And these predictions are about his birth, where he would be born, we're not going to get into them all, how he would live, what he would do, and how he would die. All of these are predicted in these Dead Sea Scrolls and the originals that were, they came from. Now, there are 300 of these messianic prophecies, we call them. 300 of them. We're not going to look at all of this afternoon because you want to go home for some dinner. We'll just look at a few of them just briefly. All right. Now, these prophecies, as you're going to see, they reveal very clearly that Jesus is who he claimed to be. That's the purpose of prophecy, remember. So when it happens, we'll believe. All right. Let's look quickly at prophecies toward the end of his life. We'll skip over the birth. He was predicted he'd be born in Bethlehem, and he was, and so on. Now, let's go to the end of his life, toward the end of his life. Number one, the amount of money he would be betrayed for is predicted 450 years before he was born by the prophet Zechariah. Notice what the Bible says. This is written before he's even born, way before. Thus says the Lord. Who's talking? The Lord, Jehovah God here. 
They weighed out for my, God is speaking here, they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. That's the price I'm going to be, be, I'm going to be sold for. Well, we all know how much he was sold for, don't we? 30 pieces of silver. Now, here's the question. How did they know that he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver, that that would be the price of a slave 450 years before? Listen, you don't even know what the price of bread's going to be next year. Forget about 450 years down the track. You don't even know what price the bread's going to be next year. You just know it's going to go up. You don't even know what price the, the, the petrol's going to be in the pump next year. Thank God it's gone down this last week. That's unbelievable, isn't it? Because, <laughs> uh, you know, that's the way it is. We don't know those things. Yet the Bible predicted this, you see. Now, how did the Bible know silver would be currency? Because silver has not always been currency down through the centuries. How did the Bible know that? Well, the Bible's no ordinary book, as we're beginning to see. and Jesus is no ordinary person. Not only does it mention the price that he would be sold for, it mentions where the money that he was sold for would be bought, where they'd bring it, and how they would spend that money. Notice the prediction again from Zechariah. Zechariah says, And the Lord, though God is speaking again, the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. God himself is saying there. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and I threw them into the house of the Lord. That's the temple for the potter. Interesting prediction. That's what they're going to do with it. They're going to bring this money to the temple and they're going to do it for the potter. They're going to use it for the potter. Now, let's come to Jerusalem for a moment. If you ever go to Jerusalem, it's good to have a little bit of our bearings. Here we are at the Temple Mount. Up here today is two mosques, well, a mosque. This one is called the Al-Aqsa Mosque. An Australian tried to burn that down a few years ago. Shame on him. Anyway, those Aussies, they're terrible guys, aren't they? <laughs> so this is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, but this is where the temple was built on top of this. This is like the retaining wall to keep it all intact so it won't crumble. And they built the temple on top. Now, the archaeologists have been excavating here this is where the temple wall is. This is what we call the Wailing Wall. It goes on the other side as well, where they come and they pray. You've seen the Jews as they come to the wall and they read their Bibles and they, their scriptures and they're looking backwards and forwards, they're praying and so on. You've seen them, I'm sure, on television. But here's the rubble from the temple that was up on top. The Romans threw it down. These little rooms here are where the people changed their money and brought their animals to make sacrifices up, up on the temple itself. They've discovered all this uh, here today. Now, just around the corner are the places where you could say, if you walk on these steps, you would say, pretty much certain Jesus walked here. Because they've uncovered the steps from the first temple, from the second temple period, the temple of Herod the Great. And so these steps go up here, and there were some gates. You can just see three of them. If you look carefully, there's three gates there. One, two, three. They're called the Hulda Gates. They used to go, the steps continued on, and they'd go upstairs, up onto the top of the platform where the temple was built. They've just bricked them off uh, in more recent times, since those days. So, you can imagine Judas comes. Maybe he come bounding up those steps when he realised, I've betrayed God Almighty. He suddenly dawns on him, hey, Jesus is going to go to death. So he comes with his money, his 30 pieces of silver. Maybe he came bounding up these very steps, we don't know. But he ended up at the temple right up on top here. And he came in and he said, hey guys, he said to the priest, I betrayed innocent blood. They said, we don't care about that, we got what we want. That's your problem. Nice way to treat him, wasn't it? So then what does Judas do? He flings that money into the temple on the floor. And now the priest said, what are we going to do with this stuff? This is blood money. So the, this is what they did, the Bible tells us. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and he departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priests consulted together and bought with them the potter's field. Unbelievable. It's recorded now in the New Testament documents, which we know are so accurate. You see, prophecy is very precise. In this occasion, we have how much he's going to be betrayed for, 450 years before, 450 years, what they're going to do with that money, where they're going to bring it, and how they're going to spend it. And that's exactly what happened. This, in other words, Jesus is God in human flesh, because this was all spoken about God. 
And then Jesus fulfills that. That's what the New Testament is telling us. All right, the method of his torture is predicted. 700 BC, Isaiah the prophet wrote these words. I gave my back to those who struck me. God is speaking. And my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and from spitting. This is the prediction that's made about Jesus the Christ. Now, you've seen The Passion of the Christ, I'm sure. It was an horrific film, wasn't it? Let me just give you one illustration of that. We know the whip that the Romans used on Jesus twice. Got 39 lashes each time. This was a short handle called the scourge and had some leather thongs coming out of it and tied to those pieces of leather was pieces of bone or lead along the strips of leather, bone or lead. So when the, the man whipped the back of a prisoner and he would pull back and as he pulled back, those those bone or lead would dig into the flesh and as he pulled it, it would rip pieces of flesh out. That's exactly what happened. This was no joke. That's why when Jesus, they came, he's finished with that treatment, or they're finished with it, they give him the cross and he can't carry the cross. I mean, this, he's, he's losing blood big time. He's, he's been up all night as well on top of that. So this was quite a graphic portrayal by Mel Gibson. The method of his death is mentioned. You will notice what it says in the book of Psalms. Now we're looking 1000 BC. The prediction is they pierced my hands and my feet. That's crucifixion language. The piercing of the hands and the feet. You see, crucifixion was perfected by the Romans, if we can say perfected. What they wanted to do was kill a man as slowly as they could, causing as much pain as they could. So crucifixion was practiced by the Romans. In fact, we have discovered, archaeologists discovered a bone of a man who had been crucified. This is a bone with a nail going through the ankle bone uh, discovered at the same time as Jesus was crucified. That's the first century period. That's where this bone comes from, that period. And they would, it's believed they would put the person sort of sideways, cross the legs like that, the, the legs, and have him hanging like so, drive the nail through the bones at the bottom. Now, the nails went through probably the wrists of the hands and through those ankle bones. Now, crucifixion was a very painful thing because it was difficult to breathe because the weight, when you're hanging down, you, you, it's very difficult to breathe. So to try to breathe, they'd pull themselves up on, the, on their, their bones on their hand to, to relieve the pressure on their, the pain on their feet as well as to breathe a little bit. And then, of course, they let go because you can't, that's terribly painful. So they drop down their weight onto the feet. And, of course, that would start to hurt after a while. And so it would be backwards and forwards from one area of pain to the other, trying to breathe at the same time. It was no joke. Crucifixion was, was a terrible way to die. Shocking. And yet the Bible predicted that. By the way, crucifixion was only practiced from about 150 BC to 320 AD. Yet the prediction was made 1000 BC. They got the time period right as well. Even before crucifixion was practiced, nearly 800 years before it was practiced this way. The method of his death, Zechariah predicts the same thing. This is 450 years. Notice what he says. God is speaking. Thus says the Lord, Jehovah, who stretches out the heavens. In other words, I create things. I laid the foundation of the earth. They will look on me whom they have pierced. Zechariah is talking about crucifixion as well. But it's about God. He's the one that will be crucified. And again, when we come to the New Testament, they record this event and he quotes from that passage. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. And he quotes from Zechariah. In other words, Jesus is God in human flesh. That's what the Bible is trying to get across to us. The predictions were made about God and fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to show you an amazing prediction now. I don't want you to try to remember this thing. I don't want you to try to... There's a resume that you can pick up as you leave, and it's got all the details. I just want you to say, whoa, that's incredible. Okay? So I want to hear you say, wow, at the end. I don't want you to try to remember it. We're going to do some maths here, okay? Now, you didn't come for maths, did you? You come for history, you had a bit of that. But we're going to do some maths this afternoon. I'm going to make it very simple for us, but I'm going to show you something that will blow your mind. 
It's certainly blown the minds of people for centuries, let me tell you, and you'll see that. I'll share with you uh, a story or two when we come to the end. Now, Jesus claimed to be the Messiah or the Christ. Now, if you claim to be the Messiah or the Christ, you were claiming to be God. That's how it was understood. That's what you were claiming to be the Messiah. Let me give you one illustration. We talked about Caiaphas a moment ago. Remember, Jesus is in front of Caiaphas, and this is what Caiaphas asks him in the trial. And the high priest said to him, Swear by oath to the living God. Are you the Christ, the Son of God? Jesus said to him, It is as you have said. Yes, I am. In fact, when a woman at the well in Samaria it was talking to Jesus in John's Gospel. Uh, she said, I know the Messiah's coming. Jesus said, that's me. I'm him. That's what he said point blank to that woman. Now he's saying it to Caiaphas. Yep, you've got it right. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Christ, the Son of God. Then the high priest tore his clothes saying, he's spoken blasphemy. In other words, he knows what Jesus is claiming. He's claiming to be God. That's blasphemy to the Jews. That's why, the way, why they crucified him as well, because he claimed to be God. All right. Was Jesus the Messiah or the Christ and therefore God in human flesh? That's the question we want to answer through this prophecy. We're going to go to the book of Daniel, chapter 9. The ninth chapter of Daniel is a fascinating chapter. Let me give you a little bit of background. You see, what's happened here is that Jerusalem has been in ruins for 70 years. Nebuchadnezzar, we saw last weekend, he came and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. We mentioned it in our first program. He flattened the city. And Jeremiah predicted that the Israelites would be in Babylon for 70 years. It's in Jeremiah's prophecies in the Bible. Well, Daniel's in Babylon and he's reading Jeremiah's prophecies. And he says, whoa, wait on, wait on, wait on. That 70 years is about up right now. So now he goes to his knees and he prays and says, basically, God, you made a promise. You said that after 70 years in, Jer in Babylon, you would bring us out and take us back to Jerusalem. You made that prediction. Now, God, please, what are you going to do about that? He's saying, God, please fulfill your promise. So he's praying there and he's on his knees. And while he's praying, suddenly Gabriel drops in and talks to him. You read this in the ninth chapter. I'm just giving you the story. Gabriel comes straight from heaven and starts to talk to Daniel. But this is what... Gabriel informs him. He informs him in this chapter. He says, Daniel, I'm going to tell you when the Messiah, the Christ, will come. I'm going to tell you the very year that he's going to turn up. That's what's mentioned in this chapter. So let's have a look at it just quickly. He begins, Gabriel's talking. Seventy weeks are determined. That means to be cut off or severed for your people and for your holy city. Now, who's Daniel's people? The Jews, the Israelites. Who is his city? Their holy city, Jerusalem, exactly. So in other words, let's put it up here. Gabriel says, Daniel, there's this 70-week period for Israel and the city of Israel, Jerusalem. That's what we want to talk about. All right? Now he goes on and he says, now listen, Daniel, know therefore and understand. I want you to get this, man. Man, he says, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, because it's in a mess, remember, from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, when he comes, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So let's put it up. He says, Daniel, this 70-week period begins with a command to restore and build Jerusalem again. And from that command, from that time, there will be a period of seven weeks and 62. Seven plus 62 is 69, right? Still is today. There'll be a 69-week period. And when we get to the end of that 69-week period, that's when Messiah will show up. That's what we just read, right? Okay. Now, when's the starting date? Because if we knew the starting date when that command was given, we'd be able to work out when the Messiah is going to show up. Just add it up to it. Pretty simple, isn't it? Let's keep going. All right. Now... In the book of Ezra, this is a record in the Bible of how the Jews come home from Babylon. The whole of the book is about that. And he gives us very specific dates of certain individuals, Persian kings. He tells us, and he's talking about the rebuilding of Jerusalem, he tells us when that is, the, the, res the restoration of the, of the city itself. In the seventh year of King Artaxerxes, I issue a decree, Artaxerxes. All right, let's go to Persia for a moment, to Iran. 
If you ever go to Iran, make sure you come to this place. It's, uh, I can't even pronounce the name. It's, uh, yeah, let's not even try it. It's a, it's a funny Persian name. But it's not far from a very important city called Shiraz. These are the tombs of the great Persian kings. We have Xerxes, the king, Artaxerxes, this guy, his father, Darius the Great. These kings are all mentioned. Now, we know what year this seventh year was of this king Artaxerxes, whose tomb we see here. We know exactly when his seventh year was in terms of BC, AD time. It was the year 457 BC because we have the Persian uh, chronology and so on. Now, something fascinating emerges in, as we look at this. You see, when the Israelites were taken captive to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, Jeremiah was left behind with the Israelites. You may record, read this in the story. And Jeremiah tells the people, you mustn't go to Egypt. God wants you to stay here and look after the land. You're the leftovers. Everybody else has gone to Babylon. But there's few of us who are here. God wants us to stay here. But they, they don't follow what Jeremiah says. And they take him with them to Egypt. And eventually, there are colonies of the Israelites in Egypt. One of them is in this island here in the, on the Nile River. Down at a place called Aswan. You can visit Aswan today, the Aswan Dam. There's this island here known as the Elephantine Island. Here they discovered a Jewish colony. They were mercenaries for the Medo-Persians, soldiers for the Medo-Persians on the border of, the Egypt, of Egypt here and south of Egypt. And you'll notice here are some of the mercenary houses here of these Jewish soldiers. But what's important is this. Archaeologists discovered a number of documents, papyrus documents. They are called Aramaic double dated. They give the things like the Persian dates and the Israelite dates and so on and so forth. And the bottom line for us here is scholars now know that that's exactly the year that the Medo-Persians said you can now build your city, 457 BC. That's on top of what we already knew. So these are amazing discoveries that archaeologists have discovered. The starting date of Daniel's time prophecy is exactly right. Now, so we've got our starting date now. Seventh year of Artaxerxes is the year 457 BC. All we need to do is add 69 weeks. So let's work this out. How many days in 69 weeks? Seven times 69, right? Seven days a week. Kids, you can tell us. How many is it? Right, exactly. 483 prophetic days in 69 weeks. Now, that's what we have. That's 69 weeks, it's 483 days. Now, before we go on, you need to know a certain principle of Bible prophecy, and we are going to encounter this again and again and again as we go through this series. In Bible prophecy, not everywhere, just in Bible prophecy, one day represents one year. For example, there are two good examples of this. Moses is about to take the Israelites into what we call Palestine. They're near Jericho and so on, before they got to this place. And he sends them spies to spy out the land, it says in the book of Numbers. And these spies go there for 40 days. They come back and they give their report to the Israelites and they say, wow, that's a tremendous place, lots of good food down there, but boy, these people are giants that live here. We could never take this place. They're too big for us. Let's go back. And only two of them give a good report and God says to the Israelites, because they're not going to go forward, he says, listen, these spies spied out 40 days in this place. You're going to wander in this desert for 40 years, every day for a year. Each day that you wandered, that the spies searched, that's how long? A year. 40 days, 40 years. And that's exactly what happened. Now, there's another one. We come to the book of Ezekiel. Who's Ezekiel? Ezekiel is a prophet living at the same time as Daniel in Babylon. Ezekiel is living with the Jewish people in Babylon. Daniel is living in the palace of the king we saw last week. Now, Ezekiel is told to do some street drama on one occasion. Well, on more than one occasion. You ever seen street drama? It's fascinating. We see some forms of street drama. If you ever go to Sydney, it's not really drama, but you see these guys painted silver and gold and they stand on these little boxes and they're... You'd go to take a photo of them, not that, and they... It's quite fascinating to watch. That's not really drama, but these on the street, 
Jeremiah, uh, sorry, Ezekiel was told to do some street drama. So Ezekiel's got a pot, he lays it on the ground, and then he lies in front of this pot in the middle of the street. And you can imagine these Jewish people walking along. What on earth are you doing down there, Ezekiel? What's going on, man? How come you're lying on the floor, the street in, in Babylon? Well, he tells them, this pot represents Jerusalem. Not yet finished for the third time yet. Three raids, remember? And the number of days I lie on my side, each of those days represent a year in literal time. It's a prophecy, you see. This is the principle that we have. So, day represents a year. So now 69 weeks is 483 days, which means what? 483 literal years in time. So let's come back to our diagram now. We've got 457 BC is the starting date. That's when the command to restore Jerusalem is given. Now we just have to add 483 years now, day for a year, and that will bring us to the Messiah or the Christ, his time, when he arrives. All right, let's do that. 457 BC. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar, 457 BC is 457 years before Jesus comes. When you go to 456 years, you're closer to Jesus. 450, down to 300, you're getting closer and closer until you get to when Jesus comes. And then you go beyond Jesus, and that becomes what we call AD, in the year of our Lord, which that's what it means. So 20 AD, 30 AD, 40 AD, we happen to live in 2000 and what, 20 AD, all right? So when you go across from BC to AD time, there's no zero year. So when you add 483 to 457, or you can take 457 from 483, that gets you the same way, you'll arrive at the year 27 AD. You have to add one because there's no zero year, all right? So we now know when the Messiah is going to come from this prophecy. We just add 483 to the starting date, 457, and we're going to end up in 27 AD. All right, let's pick this up now. So what happened in 27 AD? What happened then? Let's notice what the Bible says. We go to the book of Luke. If you've ever read the New Testament book of Luke, he is so particular about details. He talks about this guy, that guy. You say, I couldn't care less about that stuff. Well, it might help you one day when you're trying to work some things out like this. He's very specific. Let's read his, what he said. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when all the people were baptised, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptised, in other words, at this time. And while he prayed, you've probably seen this picture, the heaven was open and the Holy Spirit descended or came down in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. You've seen the pictures, I'm sure. Jesus being baptised by John the Baptist. Now, this is what's interesting here. We now know very clearly that the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, a Roman emperor, was 27 AD. We know that from Roman history and how they worked out when their king started and so on. 27 AD. Now, when you read Luke's other book, which is called the Book of Acts, which is written about what happened after Jesus went back to heaven and so on, it says these words, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. How did he anoint him? With the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came down upon Jesus at his baptism, and that's when Jesus becomes Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah. You see, the Greek word Christos or Christ means the anointed one. That's the Greek word. The word Messiah or Messiah, that's the Hebrew word, and it also means the anointed one. So Jesus becomes Jesus Christos in 27 AD, and that's when he begins his work from that point on. Jesus the Christ. He appears as the Christ in 27 AD. Now he's the Messiah at that point, you could put it that way. That's why when Jesus is baptised and he starts to speak to people, these are the words he uses in Mark. The time is fulfilled. In other words, what time? The time of the prophet Daniel. He's saying, I've arrived on time. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Christ. This is it. I've arrived on time. Unbelievable. You see, even Jesus himself said this. 
So Jesus is the Messiah. He claims it. The prophecy predicted it 500 years before. Jesus is the Messiah. Therefore, he's God in human flesh. Now, Sir Isaac Newton, that great British mathematician and scientist, was not just a scientist and a mathematician. He was a student, especially the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation, this great scientist. You know, this is the guy with the apple dropping on his head and gravity and all that sort of stuff. You remember that story. This guy was a student of Bible prophecy, and of this prophecy, Daniel 9, he wrote these words. This is the foundation stone of the Christian religion because it shows who Jesus is. He's the Messiah. He's God in human flesh. That's what it's saying here. I have a friend, Jewish, Russian Jewish friend of mine. We dug together in Jordan some years ago, Alexander Bolotnikov. Good Russian name, isn't it? But he's a Russian Jew. Bolotnikov was a devout member of the Communist Party in Russia for many years in the 80s. And he wanted to attend the Moscow University to study science. He's a brilliant guy, Alexander. And he wanted to study science at Moscow University, but for some reason he couldn't get in. And he wondered, why can't I get in? I've got good marks. I'm a member of the Communist Party. So he did some sniffing around with his father, and they discovered the reason he couldn't get into the University of Moscow because he was Jewish. So he said, OK, if that's what they're going to treat their devout members of the Communist Party, I'm out of here. I quit. So he left the Communist Party. He was an atheist at this time. But being treated like that, it made him think about his Jewish heritage, his Jewish roots. So Bolotnikov began to visit synagogues because he was a secular Jew up to this point. So he's going to the synagogues to find out about his Jewishness and his roots. And one day during this time, he meets some Christians who knew of this prophecy and shared this prophecy that we've just gone through together with Bolotnikov. And when they'd finished going through this, Bolotnikov said, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Now, he's one of thousands of Jews who've come to the same conclusion because of that prophecy. In fact, that brings us to the curse of the forbidden prophecy. You see, some Jewish rabbis down through time have seen this prophecy and they've realised if, if our Jewish people read this prophecy and they study it, they will realise that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ and we don't want that. So they made a curse on this prophecy at some time. Some rabbis, not all. Some. Here's the curse. May the spirits of those who attempt to calculate the final time, meaning of Mashiach's coming, his first coming it's talking about, may they expire. In other words, may they drop dead. That's a curse. <laughs> I come from the Sanhedrin, one of the Jewish writings there. So some rabbis didn't want their people to come to the con same conclusion as Bolotnikov came to. Uh, and that's a tragedy, but that's the reality of it. So Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is God in human flesh, according to the prophecy. Finally, there are predictions or prophecies of his resurrection from the dead, that though he would die, he would come to life again. We go to the book of Psalms now. This is written 1000 BC, Psalms chapter 16. The Bible says, You will not leave my soul in Sheol or the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. My body will not decompose, in other words. Now, who's this Holy One? Who's this talking about? This is talking about God Almighty, because you will notice here who this Holy One is, whose body won't decompose. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. Now, the Holy One is the Lord or God himself. When Peter was speaking to the Jews in Jerusalem on what we call the day of Pentecost, Luke writes about this. I want you to notice what Peter said. And he uses this same prophecy and points to Jesus. Notice what Peter said. He said, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, you have taken by lawless hands. You have crucified and you put to death. But he says, whom God raised up for David says concerning him. And he quotes what we just read. For you will not leave my soul in Hades or the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Jesus is alive. He fulfilled that prediction. His tomb is empty. I take people to the Middle East often, and I love taking them to this garden tomb, as it's called, 
We know this definitely was not the tomb of Jesus Christ. It's a nice place to visit, but it's not the tomb. But it looks nice, so it's a good place to visit. And remember about this. But on the door of this, uh, this grave, it says, He is not here. He has risen. And that's the good news. This Jesus who was crucified, he came to life again. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, let me share with you some words as we start to wrap this up. Jesus said these words before he died. He said, I lay down my life and I have power to take it up again. Now, let me tell you something that you know only too well and so do I, that when you go into the box, you're not coming out under your own steam. You're not going to raise yourself, I can assure you of that. Somebody else is going to have to do that for you. But Jesus could say, I lay down my life and I take it up again. That's because of who Jesus is. He's God in human flesh, you see. Now, that's what we're seeing through these predictions. You see, Old Testament predictions in the old part of the Bible reveal that Jesus God when you go to the New Testament. That's who he's claiming to be, God Almighty. So as we close, I want to ask a series of questions which brings us, so, so what? So what that Jesus is God in human flesh? What do, who cares about that? What does that mean to you and I sitting here in 2020? So what that Jesus is God? Let me tell you the so what's. When you go to the book of Revelation where we began this afternoon, remember these words we read, I am the first and the last. The Almighty, remember, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades, or the grave and of death. Because Jesus went into the tomb, but came out of the tomb, now he has the keys to the grave, your grave and my grave, when it's our turn to go into the box. He can get us out of the grave. That's mighty good news, you see. That becomes very relevant. And it means this, his offer of eternal life is very real. It's not just some wishful thinking. Notice what Jesus said to Martha when her brother Lazarus had died. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He or she who believes in me, who trusts in me, though they may die, they will live. So his offer of eternal life is real. It's not just wishful thinking, in other words. In other words, that last empire is a real forever hope. There really will be a time when there's no tears. There really will be a time when there's no sorrow and pain. And there really will be a time when you cannot die. If you die now, you'll come to life because he's the resurrection of life. But you'll never die again. That's good news tonight, today in our world. So what that Jesus is God? Here's the so what, number two. You're absolutely never alone. Jesus said these words, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. We have never been such a lonely planet, yet we've never lived so closely together as we do today, right? We live on top of each other in multi-storey buildings. I saw it when I flew into Brisbane each time the last couple of weeks. Boom, massive buildings living on top of each other, but lonely people. Many lonely people. Some people die. They've been dead for three or four years and nobody knew about it. You've read those in the paper. Till someone found their body three years later. Seemed that nobody cared. Nobody knew. Let me tell you, God cares about every one of us. Never alone. Always with me. Never leaves us. Never forsakes us. Jesus said that. I'm with you always. So what that Jesus is God? By the way, this promise is for all of us here this afternoon. He himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In the Greek, that's a double negative. There's no way I would think of leaving you or forsake. Your husband might abandon you for another younger woman. <laughs> True, that happens. Your wife may have another guy on the sideline. And she leaves you. Your parents may have forsaken you. Your kids may never come to see you in the aged care home, but I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That's what this means this afternoon in a real world. So what that Jesus is God? It means that our past can be forgiven. And boy, have we got some skeletons in our closets as human beings, right? 
That means Jesus can forgive our past. And we need to have our past forgiven or we can never live in the present properly. If we can't deal with our past stuff, Jesus says, that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. You know, my friend, tonight, if, if your past is haunting you, you can leave it with Jesus today now. You can say, God, take my stuff and forgive it. And he promises, if you confess, I will forgive. We don't need to go and get some tranquilizers and some, some Valium to be able to live with ourselves because of this issue. I know we have to have Valium for some other things, but we don't have to have it to deal with our past. We can say, Jesus, take my sin stuff. Take that stuff that I've done that I know I should never have done, please. And he will, he promises it. So what that Jesus is God finally? It means that you have power to live life at its very best. Because Paul wrote these words of Jesus. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's nothing that you cannot overcome in terms of your bad habit stuff and my bad habit stuff. You see, Jesus has the power to break the chains of guilt. We're terribly guilty for something we've done in the past. Jesus can give the power to break those chains of guilt that bind us. He can break the shackles of immorality. There's some of us here, maybe some of the guys, we cannot get beyond that pornographic stuff. We just cannot. You've tried, but you failed. Jesus can make you, help you do that. He really can. He's got that dynamite power. Jesus can break the bondage to material. There are some of us living in this planet today in Brisbane, maybe in this very room. We're killing our families. We're destroying relationships because we're chasing after, you know, whatever it is. Material stuff that won't hold a cracker when we come to the end of life and we have to say goodbye to people. We'll never be worried so much about the stuff. It'll be relationships that concern us. Why didn't I do that for mum? Why didn't I think about my husband more? Why didn't... That's what, how it ends up. We don't care about our stuff. We care about people in the end. Jesus can break the slavery to alcohol and drugs. Some of us may be hooked on some drug, maybe alcohol, whatever it is. Jesus can break the shackles to that stuff. He really can. Maybe some of us are trapped with anger because that's a big issue in society today and you've got a temper and you cannot control it and you've tried many times over and you can't break it. Jesus can. He can give you that victory. There's no question. He's got that power. You see, I want to illustrate it in finishing with my own parents. My mum and dad were not believers they were anything but. They lived for two things, they told us when we were, got old enough for them to tell us their story. They said, we live for two things. We live for this weekend and next weekend. Because this weekend, we went to the dances, we went to the, the, the beer stuff, and we got ourselves drunk. And on Sunday morning, we put our whole head in the toilet bowl to get over it all. And then we waited for a whole week to do it all over again. That was their life. Many people live like that today, one event to another event. One sporting fixture to another sporting fixture. But everything is a black hole till they get back to it again. For some people, it's relationships. Run after this, run after that. Other people, it's money. We're just running from one thing to another as human beings. No peace in our heart, no, no satisfaction. Something's missing. Well, my parents were like that. Well, mum's one day notices this young lady in the shirt factory where she's working. She thought, boy, this young woman, she's got so much peace in her life. She's got such a hope-filled future. She, she, she knows where she's going in life. I wish I had what she had. So mum got alongside this woman a bit closer, this young lady, and this young lady said, well, you know what, what it is? She says, it's this guy called Jesus. He lives in my life. I've asked him to come into my life. And she said, that's why I'm like I am. So this lady helped my mum to accept and follow this Jesus. As soon as mum becomes a believer in Christ and becomes a, a follower of Jesus, a voice speaks to her in her head and says, stop locking your husband out of the house like you do when he's drunk. <laughs> oh, mama mia, how can you have a drunk guy in your house? So mum would go to the doors, mad as a meat ax, want to give him five of the very best. <laughs> want to pound him down. And he's drunk. And he's on the other side of the door. So she's on this side of the door. She prays, oh, God, help me love this guy. Please, I need your help. God always answered that prayer. The anger would just go dripping, just fall off. She'd open the door, welcome the dad home. After a while, dad starts to think, what's got into this woman? How come no more of this stuff? What's going on here? <laughs> he used to travel for Telstra. Well, it was PNG back in those days. And, and he used to travel a lot. He's up in Carnarvon, north of Western Australia there somewhere. 
and he's in his hotel room as a traveller. He's got his beer glass in one hand, drinking like a fish. He's got his cigarette in the other, smoking like a chimney. That's how he used to carry on. And a voice spoke to my dad. Harvey, what are you doing with your life? He's in his hotel on his own room. He's on his own in his room. What are you doing with your life, man? My dad thought about my mum, I guess the changes that were taking place. And right there in that hotel room, he said, God help me, my life is a mess. That was the last time my dad ever smoked or drank. That's a miracle. That's the power of God. My sister, she's seven years older than me, she said, you know, until that mum and dad became followers of Jesus, our home was so dysfunctional, fighting, arguing, dysfunctional. But when Jesus came in, that stuff got less and less and less until we became a happy family. Now, God can do that for any one of us, let me tell you. He's the powerful God. He wants us to have life of power, of peace and of hope. I think we should stop now as we close and thank God for these prophecies. They're not just about stuff in the future. They help us to believe, but they help us to see that God can help us with our stuff. Let's just bow together in prayer. Father, thank you for these amazing prophecies. Thank you that it's about how we can have life at its best today. Yes, they deal with the future and how we can face things. We need to know that. But Lord, thank you, God, that you've given us these prophecies so we can believe. We can put our trust in you and you can start to bring meaning and purpose and hope in our lives. Bless us as we go to our homes. Keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, make sure as you leave this afternoon, you get a copy of the two presentations today. We'll be back here again when? Tomorrow afternoon. We have two programs again tomorrow afternoon. Star Wars on Patmos. Don't miss when we talk about King Tutankhamun, Pharaoh Tutankhamun and the journey to Egypt. You're going to love these two programs tomorrow. We're going to answer the question, why is there so much suffering? So we'll go to Star Wars on Patmos. Patmos. That's tomorrow at two o'clock. Then on Monday night, Monday night, right here, seven o'clock, the Middle East at the crossroads. Sin, sex, and the Phoenicians. That sounds interesting, doesn't it? We're going to be going to the city of Carthage. We're going to be going to some amazing places about human sacrifice. Don't miss the programs the rest of this weekend. Then next week we have some more. The next program, this time next Saturday, the Omen, Egypt, and the Book of the Dead. So we look forward to seeing you. Make sure you get some of those brochures. I think we have some. Yes, thanks, Sir Jared. Make sure you get some of these as you leave. Take some to your neighbours. Take some to your, your family, your relatives, your cat, your dog, and bring them along. They'll enjoy the program. We'll see you next uh, tomorrow.